primary school children are invited to join us on Saturday the 28th of May for a movie fundraiser at the church. There will be a screening at 10 and another one again at 1pm. The ticket price is 50 Rand per child and there will be popcorns and snacks on sale. Do join us as we support this fundraiser in aid of the holiday club that will take place in the June and July school holidays. Hello friends and welcome to worship. The title of today's message is Indistractable. It's a, it's a word which was coined recently by the author uh, Nur El as he put together two words, uh, distractible and, uh, and indestructible, be, meaning not able to be destroyed. Uh, and so we get this word indistractable. My prayer for you as you enter worship today is that nothing will distract you from fixing your eyes upon Jesus and hearing his word spoken into your life today. My prayer is also that this time of worship will make you resilient, indestructible in the face of whatever pressures might be bearing upon you at this time. And so our call to worship is from Psalm 37 verse 7. Why don't you listen to these words? Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Let us pray. Glorious and gracious God, we fix our eyes on you in worship now. We open our ears to your still, small voice. We open our hearts to the encouraging work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Have your way with us now, we pray. Amen. There is a song, I know it well, a melody that's never fled on mountains high in valleys low. My soul will rest my heart.
Our Heavenly Father, what a, what a privilege it is to be in your presence. What a privilege it is to be worshipping your name. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can, that we can sing this, this morning about hope in a time where, where hope is thin, in a time where, where there's a lot of desperation around us and, and even amongst us, where, where we don't always see the light, where we don't always see the hope. And then we can sing this morning that hope has a name and his name is Jesus. Lord Jesus, we, we don't deserve any of this. We, we live in a way that, that doesn't even reflect our gratitude. And yet every morning we are reminded of, of your love for us. We are reminded of how great you are. Things that we, we, we don't even notice anymore. Things that happens around us that we just take for granted. Lord Jesus, this, the sun that comes up and the air that we breathe and, and the fact that we, can, that we can sit here right now and worship you and that we can have, have online church in a time where, where some of us just can't physically go to church. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for that. We thank you that we are reminded that we two or more meet, you are there. So Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that you are here. We thank you that you've got an appointment with each and every one of us. We thank you that you want to meet with us, that you are our Father and you love us and you've got a desire just to have a relationship with us. And we thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. Oh Jesus, we pray for for your for your blessing on, on our time today. We pray that you will open the the eyes and the, the ears of our hearts, of our souls, and that and that you meet with us today. We pray that you will fill our hearts with the comfort that we need and that you will bless us with the wisdom that we need for the days to come. We pray that you will fill our hearts with, with real gratitude, that we will live a life that reflects the gratitude we have for the mercy that you give us every day, for the provision that you give us every day, for the forgiveness. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can meet with you here, right now. Amen. Thank you. 
Friends, we're continuing our worship by coming before God with our gifts and our offerings. So I want to share with you a very short scripture today and, and leave you with that. Um, it is Proverbs 18 verse 16. And that just speaks to, to um, why we give. What is the reason for our giving? It's not because God needs our resources. He gave it to us. So it, it's not. A, we mustn't fool ourselves by thinking that although there's practical reasons and practical ways where God uses our money, it's not about that. Um, and here is, here is the key. Proverbs 18 verse 16. A gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. I'm going to read that again. A gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. And I'm going to leave you with that. And I'm going to invite you to give with a cheerful heart today in obedience to God. Uh, the Westfield Bank details will be on screen. You're welcome to use it now or you can use it uh, sometime after the service. Have a blessed day. Hi Westview. It's lovely to be with you again today. Please join me in prayer. Blessed Father God, it is with joy in our hearts that we come before you today with our tithes and offerings. Thank you that we are a part of your kingdom and that we can give in this way to share what you have given us. May the love in our hearts not only be a feeling, Lord, but an action, an action that brings us closer to you and grows your community on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, our family cross this week goes out to Alison Tuttle, who landed in uh, South Africa from the United States. Alison is uh, studying divinity at Duke Divinity School, and she's going to be interning here as part of the Westview community for the next two months. She leaves behind her husband in the United States. And so during this week, won't you join with me in praying God's richest blessing, not just upon her, but also upon family uh, that she has left behind. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you for your call upon Alison's life. We thank you for the privilege of having her as part of our community uh, over these next two months. And Lord, I pray that as she has the family cross uh, reminding her uh, of our prayers for her, that she would grow in her understanding of call, that she would discover her connection with her uh, family in Christ here in South Africa, and that you would use our time together to draw us nearer to your kingdom purposes. We pray your blessing upon Alison's husband and family that remain behind in the US and pray that they too will experience your gracious presence. For we ask it in the name and spirit of Jesus. Amen. Justin Rosenstein has tweaked the operating system on his laptop to block Reddit. He has banned himself from Snapchat which he compares to heroin, and he has imposed limits on his use of Facebook. But he has found that even this is not enough. And so the 34-year-old tech executive recently took the more radical step of restricting his use of social media and other addictive technologies. When he upgraded to the latest iPhone, he instructed his, assistants, his assistant to set up a, a parental control feature to prevent him from downloading any apps uh, without her permission. Rosenstein was particularly aware of the allure of Facebook likes, which he describes as bright dings of pseudo pleasure that can be as hollow as they are seductive. What, what makes Joel uh, Rosenstein's radical action so interesting is that he was the Facebook engineer who 10 years ago uh, coded, uh, designed the like button, which was then known as the awesome button. 10 years after he did that, Joel belongs to a growing band of what a Guardian newspaper article on the subject calls Silicon Valley heretics, tech engineers who, who are concerned about the effects that our always on world is having, the effects that always being on and connected is having on our ability to concentrate, the effect that it is having on our mental health and the mental health of our children even on the, the future of social cohesion and, and Western democracy itself. 
as we enter this three-week preaching series called Screen Sanity. Uh, let me start by just nailing my colors to the mast. I love my phone. I mean, I, 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 I really love this device, the, the size of my hand, which opens up a world of opportunity to me. With my phone, I'm able to communicate with my sisters and their family in Saudi Arabia and in England. With my phone, I'm able to stay in touch with global news events in real time as they happen, to follow developments in, in the war in Ukraine uh, almost uh, as soon as they are happening. With my phone, I'm, I'm able to connect to God using the uh, Ignatian devotional app, which comes to me from the United Kingdom. Recently, I've discovered podcasts, and, and using podcasts on my phone, I can, I can redeem uh, the time spent driving in my car as I drive back from dropping the kids at school or some other social event by listening to thought-provoking interviews and, and podcasts that, that stretch my thinking. With my phone, I can listen to whatever music delights my heart, and my, uh, what I once thought was an extensive CD collection gathers dust on the CD rack as, uh, as the uh, repertoire of music I can listen to has just expanded beyond what I could ever have dreamed. With my phone, I can track my runs, the distance that I've gone, the pace that I've run, and so on. And so I'm guessing that, that you're like me. I'm guessing that most of you really appreciate the world of opportunities that your phone or your device has opened up to you. And, and yet, and yet there, is, there is another side to our devices that, that many of us, if we are honest, that many of us struggle with. It, it may be that as you work on your laptop, uh, you find it hard to focus on, on the tasks at hand as notifications ping repeatedly uh, uh, calling you to check out what has been uh, appearing on your social media feeds, luring you away from what you know to be important. It may be that, that you are affected by the depression and anxiety and other mental health disorders that are, are we are told, reaching epidemic pr proportions, especially amongst younger people. It may be that you are experiencing that relationship between parents and children or between partners are, are taking strain as, as, as that kind of real, slow, face-to-face um, -face communication that, that was so much characterized our relationships in a past era is replaced by people sitting in the same living room uh, and, and yet living in different worlds that comes to them from respective screens. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been at a restaurant and noticed people at a table next to you, perhaps an entire family of people, and every single one of them is oblivious to the others sitting around the table as they are all on their devices. And so we see that, that, that deep thought, that deep reflection, that deep connection, that deep spirituality is being affected, is being threatened by this ocean of experiences and information flooding over our lives, coming at us from our devices, an ocean that is a mile wide, but is so shallow, just, just an inch deep. And so over these next three weeks, we're going to offer you some tools or some tips or some ideas that will equip you to navigate your way through the brave new world uh, of, of, of tech in a way that <clears throat> honors who, who God has created you to become, uh, in a way that honors who God desires you to become. For you see, your mind, your spirit, your emotion, your, your will, um, each one of these is, is a battleground. Uh, each one of these is a battleground be be between forces which enable you to become all that God intends you to be and forces which pull you down to settle for a kind of insipid mediocrity that will leave you with less joy, uh, less peace, less love and, and less impact for God's kingdom. Now, we, when, when we turn to Scripture to find out what the Scripture has to say about this, it's no surprise, is it, that there isn't any mention in the Bible of, of the addictive nature of social media notifications or of the danger of spending too much time on our devices. And yet, yet there is a timelessness about Scripture that speaks to every single age and situation. 
There are scriptures through which God can speak to us about the challenges of, of living in an always on world. One of the scriptures that I think we need to give attention to when we talk about this topic is Psalm 62. And so today I want to invite you to reflect with me on the first six verses of this psalm. Uh, psalm 62 was penned about three millennia before our internet age. And yet I believe these words can help us to reflect on what it means to live well with our devices. I'm reading to you from the contemporary English version. Only God can save me and I calmly wait for him. God alone is the mighty rock that keeps me safe and the fortress where I am secure. I feel like a shaky fence or a sagging wall. How, how long will all of you attack and assault me? You want to bring me down from my place of honor. You love to tell lies. And when your words are kind, hatred hides in your heart. Only God gives inward peace and I depend on him. God alone is the mighty rock that keeps me safe and he is the fortress where I feel secure. We give thanks to God for this reading from scripture. Friends, the first thing I invite, us you, invite you to notice about these words of scripture is the feeling that the author King David has of being assaulted from every side. The psalmist feels assaulted on every side. Did you notice his words in verse 3? How long will you attack and assault me? I feel like a shaky fence or a sagging wall. Notice not only the, the feeling that David has of being attacked on every side, but also his awareness of the impact that it's having on him, on how he feels, on his psychological and his physical and his emotional well-being. He feels like a, a shaky fence, a sagging wall. And, and I wonder if you've ever felt this way. You know, I think that when David wrote about being assaulted from every side, and about feeling so vulnerable. He was obviously des de describing military forces or armies that were railing against him. Perhaps it was his rebel son Absalom's army that was encircling his camp. And few of us, uh, unless you, you have fought in a war, a few of us can relate to the feeling of being assaulted on every side by violent enemies. But what many of us will relate to is the, is the feeling of being assaulted on every side by our news feeds or by our social media feeds or just by too much information coming at us. And the irony is that as we find ourselves assaulted by what comes at us through our devices, we keep going back to these same feeds, almost like a dog returning to its vomit. Some of you might have heard of the term doom scrolling. And uh, doom scrolling is when, when between Zoom meetings or between university lecturers or between tasks at work, you find yourself just scrolling through your news, news feed. And, and as you doom scroll, headlines like, uh, like long COVID may affect your health permanently or war in Ukraine leads to global food scarcity or South Africa is on a precipice. These headlines kind of flood your consciousness and, and you find yourself just being dragged down and becoming more and more depressed. Psychologists explain the, the mechanism behind doom scrolling. They tell us that what happens with doom scrolling is that during a, a time of crisis, we human beings are wired to gather as much information as we can about our environment in order that we can be equipped to overcome that crisis. And, and this information gathering worked really well for us when we were, when we were living in caves and the enemy that we attacked was a, a roaring lion, perhaps. Uh, we would instantly gather information about our environment. Is there a, a tree nearby that I can climb? Or do I have an arrow with which I can fight the lion? Or, or do I fight or do I run? And, and so we became hardwired at gathering information in times of stress and uncertainty. The problem is that now, now we live in a world in which we are bombarded by too much information. We are still trying to gather as much information as we can, but the information that comes to us is overwhelming. And it's information that we can really do very little about. 
And so, and, and so we, uh, <coughs> the, the information leaves us feeling very much like the psalmist felt, attacked, assaulted on every side, overwhelmed, like a shaky fence or a sagging wall, weighed down under the weight of it all. And so friends, as we think about our relationship with our devices and how our devices affect us, it's important that you and I start by noticing, like the psalmist did, by noticing the negative impact that the way we use our devices can have on us. Because unless we are careful, we're going to be left feeling bombarded and overwhelmed and fragile and and vulnerable um, without acknowledging it. So the psalmist feels assaulted on every side. The second thing I invite you to notice about this psalm is that the psalmist acknowledges God as the source of his peace and well-being. He acknowledges God as the source of his peace and well-being. Verse 1, he writes, only God can save me. And then in verse 2, he writes, God alone is the mighty rock that keeps me safe and the fortress where I'm secure. You know, for many of us, I I think there's a danger that that our devices can become idols, uh, that they can replace God as the one that we turn to for salvation and for security. This week, as we welcome Alison Tuttle from Duke Divinity School into our community, I'm reminded of a, a conversation that I had with the staff member at Duke who is responsible for placing all of their Divinity School students at uh, two-month placements or internships, mostly at uh, churches or nonprofits around the U.S., but also some international students. And a few years ago, she was telling me about how she had had to remove one of the Div School students from her placement at in, in a very rural community of North Carolina. And the reason why the student had to be pulled out of the placement is that there was no internet access there. And without having internet access, she felt unsafe. She felt insecure. Uh, her levels of anxiety went through the roof. And, uh, and ultimately, the only thing to do was to pull her back to a space where she could be a part of that always on world. Now, be, before we, uh, we, uh, we judge or uh, anybody who is like that, I, I think we need to just pause to acknowledge that, um, that for many of us, uh, that is our experience too. When we are separated from our device, we begin to feel anxious. We want to check in and see what's come out through. We want to make sure that nobody is trying to get hold of us. And uh, I've even noticed that tendency in myself. So for too many of us, the, the psalm that we sing has become this psalm. My device alone is the mighty rock that keeps me safe and the fortress where I am secure. Do you see how our devices can become idols that replace the role of God in our lives? You see, the problem with idolatry, with putting something else in the place that uh, should rightly be reserved for God, it's not that God gets jealous of, of the idol and, and God is a fragile ego and wants to be the center of it all. That's, that's not it at all. But the problem with idolatry is that when we place our faith in anything less than God, we find that that thing is going to let us down. It's going to drop us faster than, than Eskim does, and we are going to be left crushed as a result of our idolatry. And so whether that idol is is your device or your possessions or that person in your life, um, the the, the idol is ultimately going to lead you down a path that is is not going to be for your well-being. And so the psalmist acknowledges God alone as his source of peace and well-being. And the truth is that all of us need to discover And all of us need to acknowledge and live into this reality. The third thing I invite you to notice about this text is the psalmist's invitation to mindfulness. The psalmist's invitation to mindfulness. Mindfulness is when you you deliberately focus your attention on the the present. When when you or I are, are mindful, you won't allow yourself to be distracted by other thoughts, constantly running through your heads. We don't allow ourselves to be distracted by thoughts which take us away from this time, from this place, 
from this person who is who is opposite us. We, we clear the noise from our mind, mind so that we can be fully present to the now, to this present moment. And so when the psalmist says in verse 1, I calmly wait for God, he is deliberately centering himself. You know, when I read those words by David, I, I picture David removing all distractions and, uh, and getting himself in the right posture and, and slowing his breathing. Becoming aware of God's presence, pushing back the noise. And then when he has done that, he is able to pray those words with great truth and power. Only God gives inward peace and I depend on him. God alone is the, the mighty rock that keeps me safe. God is the fortress where I feel secure. So this week I spoke to Elisa Graham, a member of our congregation who's a counseling psychologist, and I spoke to her about the importance of mindfulness to our well-being and to our spirituality. Why don't you listen in on our conversation? Hi Elisa, thanks so much for uh, joining me in this conversation. Uh, it would be great if you could just tell me, uh, as a counseling psychologist, what is the link between mindfulness and mental health? Um, Ian, so that's quite an interesting question. I think um, we're starting to understand that mindfulness is a really fantastic tool and practice to help us to sort of move towards um, better mental health in, in many ways. Um, so mindful, what mindfulness really is about is becoming aware of our emotional state, becoming aware of um, self-awareness, what's happening for us, and in that way, being able to respond in ways that are helpful to us uh, rather than react um, emotionally. So, um, you know, in my own practice, in terms of anger management, anxiety, um, any sort of space where we're feeling emotionally dysregulated. Uh, I find that mindfulness is a very helpful tool um, to, for that. Um, yeah, so that's part of why mindfulness is really useful in our mental health. It helps us to stop, take a breath, observe what's happening in ourselves, and then decide how to proceed from there. Okay, great. And and what, do you believe that our uh, our devices, uh, the the always on world in which we live, is having an impact on our ability to be mindful? Is this something that you find in your work? Uh, very much so. I think you know one of the things about mindfulness is it tries to um, train the brain essentially to to be present. And of course, devices do quite the opposite to that. Um, and, and so uh, really, I want to almost say that devices um, make us mindless. You know, you think of yourself scrolling through your phone on social media to, to what end. Um, and that's quite in contrast to, to what mindfulness is trying to um, create in a person. Mm, thank you. And, and as a Christ follower yourself, who also uh, uh, trains people in mindfulness, do you see a link between being a follower of Jesus and being mindful and mindfulness? Um, I think there is for a variety of reasons. The first reason is um, one of the stances of mindfulness is to, to sort of at first take a non-judgmental stance. And so, you know, if we're feeling anxious or so, to, to just take a step first and, and observe it for what it is, rather than going, oh, no, I mustn't be, uh, you know, anxious. And, and so I think that principle in itself, taking a stance of non-judgmentalness non to be able to um, discern or, or make good judgments, um, that's a, a very much a principle that I believe uh, links into to being a Christ follower. But I also think, Ian, to some extent, um, Christ himself was quite mindful. You know, you think about in scripture, we read, um, be still and know that I'm God. So we're told um, in the Bible to, to at times be still um, and, and, you know, focus and um, I want to almost say uh, self-reflect. Um, and, and that's something one can work into mindfulness. You can definitely um, gel the two, if I can put it that way. Uh, your faith as well as practices which which help you to to quieten the soul um, and also I mean if you think about 
the fact that mindfulness helps us to regulate our emotions and not be reactive, um, I think that makes us better people. We, we will respond um, in um, healthy ways to our environment, in healthy ways to in our interpersonal relationships. Um, so I think there are many benefits that any Christ follower can, um, can get from mindfulness. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those profound insights, Elisa. Super. There's so much we can learn about mindfulness there, can't we? And, and we read in the psalm how the psalmist invites us to, to copy his example of becoming mindful in the way that we live our lives. Now, friends, I, I want to talk to you today as individuals, but I also want to talk to those of you who play some role in parenting of your children or of your grandchildren or of a relative's children, perhaps. So let's start with you as an individual. I want to invite you now just to think about what role your device plays in, in your life. You know, our devices make great servants, but they make tyrannical masters. So let me ask you, are, are you ruling your device or is your device ruling you? Maybe it's time for you to get intentional. Maybe it's time for you to put boundaries in place, to dethrone your device from the center of your life so that God can take up his rightful place on the throne of your life. And there's some very practical things that you can do to make these adjustments. Maybe, maybe you want to turn off the notifications on your apps so that they're not constantly being enticed you're not constantly being enticed to check them every single moment. Maybe you want to remove the icon of certain apps from the home screen of your phone so that it's just a few more swipes away in order to access those apps and that might affect how easily you are distracted by them. You might want to discipline yourselves to visiting certain news or social media apps just once a day. I mean, do you remember how our parents would read the newspaper in the morning? And then they'd put it away and get on with their day, or, or perhaps the same in the evening. Do we really need to know what's happening in the world every minute uh, as the events unfold? And then I want to say a word to families, especially to those of you who are parents or who are parenting. What if you were to set a screen Sabbath? Where, for example, Sunday afternoons became the time where, where everybody puts their devices away and covenants to be present to each other. We've experimented with this in my family. We, we don't always get it right, but we, uh, we had some wonderful afternoons where once the screens are away, we have pulled out board games and we've played, uh, we've played Monopoly or we've played the Settlers of Catan or we've played Risk or we've played Rummy and we've had a great afternoon just connecting and enjoying each other, being in the same space and of one mind as we have played together. You know, load shedding can be, can be a time of screen Sabbath where uh, we intentionally all gather around to do something by candlelight or torchlight that you, you cannot do when there's no electricity. Parents, we need to be careful, you know, it's so easy in our busy lives to, to leave our kids' devices to, to raise them and to amuse them. And, uh, and I, I want to encourage you to be fully present to your children when your children reach out to you. Don't be giving your child divided attention where when your child comes to speak to you, you're listening to them with one ear, but your eyes and your other ear is on your device. Give your child your undivided attention. It's one of the greatest gifts that you can give to a child. The feeling that in that moment where you are with them, they are the most important thing in the world to you. And that's something which as parents we need to practice regularly. There's a real danger that this generation of children will grow a feeling that they were always competing for daddy or mommy's attention uh, with, with the phone. So try as possible in the evenings when you get home from work just to put aside your devices in order that you can be present to your kids. Friends, as I pull all of this together, let us keep our eyes on the prize. Let us keep our eyes on the, on the vision that God has for your life and for my life. You see, God desire, desires us to, to live in a deep connection with himself, 
the connection that is only possible when we push back all of the noise and become mindful of God's presence and listen to him. And God's desire is for us to live in deep connection with the people around us, a connection which requires us to put our devices down and to be present to those around us, to be fully present to those around us. And then God desires for us to live lives of joy and peace, a joy and a peace which is diminished when our hearts and minds are pulled in a million different directions by uh, all of the connections that come to us through our devices. And God invites us to deal with anything in our lives which is getting in the way with that deep connection with him and with others and with the joy of life that he has created us for. Won't you join with me in prayer? God, who is always more attentive to us than we are to you, we acknowledge you as the source of our well-being and peace. God, we thank you for the opportunities which our devices offer us, for the opportunity to grow and to connect and to have fun and to share your love. But God, will you, will you forgive us for those times when we have allowed your gifts to become idols in our hands? Holy Spirit, won't you help us to live with you at our centre and with our devices as our servants and never our masters? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us share the blessing of God with each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. Friends, go into this week placing God at the center of your life, pushing back the distractions that come to you in whatever way they may come, and allowing God to be the fortress uh, in which you find safety and joy and life. Amen.